Hi, CD Life Church. This is Michael Frost and super, super, super sorry I can't be with you uh, this Sunday to share this word with you live face to face, which is, I think, the best way that teaching is meant to be delivered. But as you've no doubt heard, I'm locked down in, in Sydney and, uh, and was unable to be at your Inspire conference over the last couple of days, and I'm unable to be with you this Sunday, which is really disappointing. I was really looking forward to kind of getting a bit of feel for the the sea life life. Um, I've heard so much about you guys over the years, and of course, I'm good friends with uh, with Kim Hammond, and he talks to me a lot about uh, Sea Life Church and Sea Life Culture and uh, and how at home he feels there. And so I guess as a friend of his, I want to thank you for the way you've made space for, for people like Kim and Maria to really exercise really remarkable missional leadership in your church. So thank you to Andrew Chisholm for his invitation to be with you. Um, we're going to have a look at a couple of stories, actually, from uh, the Gospels. And in particular, I want to encourage you to think seriously about what the mission of Sea Life Church will look like when shaped by the kind of values and vision that Jesus has. Not that I'm suggesting you don't already, but to encourage you even further into that into that venture. So by way of kind of introducing what I want to share, I want to start with a story uh, of an experience I had a few years ago. Uh I don't know, I'm sure you've had experiences where you've attended church services and you've never been able to forget about them because they've been so kind of profoundly shaping for you. And that was certainly the case with me a number of years ago. I attended a, I guess you'd say it's a communion service or a Eucharist service, uh, but it was unlike anything that I and I suspect you have ever experienced. Um it was held in a very traditional looking building. So I'm talking about big, high ceilings, stained glass windows, you know, the churchiest church you could kind of imagine. But the difference was all of the furnishings were removed from the church, uh, all the, all the furniture on the, on the stage, all the pews. I mean, it was completely empty, but for kind of the beautiful, uh, surroundings, uh, in the building. The floor had been completely covered in black plastic from wall to wall. So that when you walked in, it was had a very sort of visceral effect. It's like, looks like a grand, beautiful church, but it's completely empty except for a black plastic floor. And right in the middle of the church, the middle of the sanctuary, there's no seating, but right in the middle of the floor, there was a gigantic pile, a mountain of household garbage. I mean, rubbish, the stuff you put in your garbage bin, not not hard rubbish. Uh, I'm talking about kind of food scraps and milk bottles and empty tin cans and you name it. The normal stuff that you throw out with your wet rubbish collection. They had bought in a pile of it and put it right in the middle of the church. So when you walked in, I mean, you could not help, obviously, than smell it. You couldn't help but observe it and be stunned by it. And also, you couldn't help but try to avoid all the rivers of kind of garbage juice that were kind of running out from the middle there. I mean, it was it was stunning, shocking. When we arrived, no one told us where to stand or what to do, so we just kind of fanned out and stood around the mountain of garbage. And then when the service started, two men came out and they were wearing kind of robes, I guess, like um, monks' robes, like cassocks. And they both began to kind of lead us in this communion service, which included uh, responsive prayers and a cappella singing. There were four screens on each corner of the room and we we uh, were led uh, through various songs and prayers and, and, and Bible readings and the like. But I have to be honest with you, no mention was made about this mountain of garbage. And while I was trying to focus on the words and the prayers and the Bible readings and the like, I couldn't help but think, why are we standing surrounding a giant pile of wet rubbish? Well, that question was soon answered. After a certain period of time, as we were led in communion service, the two men who were leading us walked down from the platform down toward the pile of garbage. They told us that now it's the time for us to celebrate the Lord's Supper. They removed their robes. They're just wearing Speedos. And they walked into the pile of rubbish, like wading into 
the garbage. They were kind of up to their thighs in filthy refuse. And as they were doing this, they're leading us. As we come now to the table, let's ready ourselves, let's prepare ourselves. This is the feast that Christ called us to eat. The, the usual things that are said at the Eucharist gathering. But I was just completely shocked by what was going on. And as they were leading us, one of them then reached down into the mountain of garbage and they pulled out a, a wine bottle in a brown paper bag. The other one reached down and pulled out a loaf of bread thankfully wrapped in plastic. And as they led us, they said, these elements represent the, the blood and the body of Christ. And they said to us, this is the Christ who came not only to suffer and die for our sins. This is the Christ who came not only to defeat sin and death and the devil and having defeated these things to rise again and to call us into glorious relationship with God the Father. We celebrate both of those things, they said, but we celebrate more than that. We also celebrate in this feast the most extraordinary miracle in all of history, the miracle of the incarnation, that our God took on flesh and dwelt among us. You know, C.S. Lewis once said, the incarnation is the central miracle in history. All miracles before it point to it, and every miracle since proceeds from it. Those two men standing in that mountain of garbage then said to us, if you choose to eat this bread and drink this wine in remembrance of the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, we invite you to take your shoes off, hitch up your skirt or your dress, pull up the, 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 the legs of your trousers, and we invite you to come hearing the words of your Lord and Saviour who said to his followers, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And if you choose to eat this bread and drink this wine this day, let it be that not only are you thanking Christ for his death on your behalf, not only are you thanking God for the forgiveness that has been offered to you in Christ. Not only are you thanking God for the resurrection and the hope of eternity, but also you are saying to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, send me as you sent the Son. If you choose to eat this bread and drink this wine this day, they said, take your shoes off and wade into the garbage, knowing that our God loved us so much, he was willing to take on flesh, to wade into the mire and the muck and the brokenness and the pain of humanity. And then, having defeated the power of that sin, to then call us as his followers to do likewise. As the Father sent me, says Jesus, so I send you. Folks, I've taken communion a lot of times. Sometimes I've taken it, I'll be honest with you, without much thought. But I had to think long and hard that day. Am I willing to say to God the Father, send me. Send me to wade into the brokenness of humanity. Send me forth to mirror the work of Jesus in this world. And the day that I went to that communion feast, I remember the bread sticking to the roof of my mouth. I remember it being hard to swallow down the wine because I realised again the gravity of what it is that we say to Christ, I will follow you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. This tells us inherently two things. One is that our God is a sent and sending God. It's inherent to the Godhead. What do the three persons do with each other? Well, we can speculate on all sorts of things about the relationships between the three persons of the Godhead. But the one thing that we can say for sure, because Scripture tells us, is that they send each other. God the Father sends God the Son, and God the Father, God the Son, then send God the Holy Spirit. And then that cycle is not complete until we recognise that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit send us, his followers, as 
The Father sent the Son, so we are sent. Therefore it follows, not only should we eat this feast as a recognition of all that Christ has done for us, but we should eat this feast as a recommissioning, a reordaining to the work to which each of us have been called to be sent ones in this world. I'm sure you all know that one of your pastors, Kim Hammond, has written a book called Sentness. Now, he knows as well as I do that's just a made-up word. But it's a beautiful word insofar as it describes our inherent identity. We are the sent ones. We are to live out our sentness in this world. As the Father sent the Son, so Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit send us. So every Christian ought to be able to answer the question, to whom have you been sent? To whom has God asked you to wade into the brokenness, the dirt, the muck, the mire, the, 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 the unpleasantness of people's lives in this world? To whom has God sent you? Because what we find all the way through the Gospels, of course, is Jesus modelling for us what it means to have been sent like him. In the story that uh, that I asked to be read uh, from John chapter 8, we see Jesus modelling this in the most dramatic, and I'd want to suggest to you one of the most terrifying kind of stories in the Gospels. It's a story that clearly indicates to us the two ways that are on offer for us when it comes to living out our faith. The one way is modelled for us by this angry, self-righteous, sanctimonious, bloodlust obsessed uh, group of religious people. These are the men who drag a woman out of bed, having caught her in adultery, and prepare to stone her to death. Now remember, no man is being stoned to death here, only the woman, only the nobody, only the weak one in, uh, in Jesus' time. Only the one who is powerless to to object. She is dragged from the bed and she is to be stoned to death. Could you imagine anything worse than being stoned to death? I mean, could you even imagine stoning someone to death? It's unimaginable. Imagine the terror that she must feel as she anticipates this horror which is about to befall her. But then this crowd, motivated by their religious faith, remember, this crowd say, wait, wait, wait. Let's not stone her straight away. Jesus is down at the temple. He's talking about love and grace and forgiveness. Let's take her down there and see how far his forgiveness goes. Because they know if Jesus says, nah, let her go, but, you know, be forgiving, they'll be able to say, ha-ha, you know, he can't be the Messiah. He, he rejects the, the law of Moses. But if he says, yes, yeah, stone her, They'll be able to say to all the crowds, look at him, he's brutal, he's cruel. And so they drag this woman through the streets to throw at the feet of Jesus. Now, my friends, she is already terrorised, already anticipating the worst. And they prolong this in order to drag her through the streets in order to humiliate Jesus as an object, as a tool to their particular religious agenda. Now, can you imagine anything more despicable than that? Their religious faith leads them to treat people as things, as objects, as tools. This is the world of it. This is the world of objectifying others. And it's one of the most fundamental, one of the most basic or core expressions of human sin. You don't just encounter it in this story, you see it all the way through our lives, even today, don't you? the way we treat people we have no use for, the way we get treated by people who need us in some way. You find in the business world where we're being told all the time who we should connect to because it'll be good for our business, Uh, the way in which we find ourselves using people for relationships, for love, for all sorts of things, and the way, as I said before, that we discard those we have no use for. Have a look at the way we treat the elderly, those with intellectual disability. Have a look at the way we treat people that we don't need We treat them as objects. This is the way of the world. And those self-righteous men who drag that terrorised woman through the street are completely obsessed with simply fulfilling their objective. Humiliate Jesus. No matter what cost this woman has to bear because of it. 
You don't just find it all the way through our world today. You don't just find it with these men. You find it all the way through scriptures, the way in which, in the Gospels in particular, you find the Pharisees and others treating people like objects. In the very next chapter to the one that we've looked at, we're looking at chapter John chapter 8, but in John chapter 9, you watch the disciples do the same thing. The disciples see a man born blind and they say to Jesus, huh, Jesus, whose fault is it that this, this man should be born blind? Is it his fault or is it his parents' fault? This is because in the ancient world, the assumption was that if you were born, if you, sorry, had a, a disability, a, a chronic illness, you were lame or blind, you had some kind of besetting kind of illness or, or disability, that clearly, you know, the gods, as far as the pagans were concerned, or God, as far as the Jews were concerned, must be punishing you for some some sin or some infraction in your life. But the difficulty was if you're born blind, like this man was, well, he didn't sin, so whose sin was it that caused him to be blind? You can understand why the disciples are asking it. But here's my point. Aside from the theological question about who sinned or whose fault this was or that was, can you see how they have no compassion for this man? They don't see a blind man and say, Jesus, do something. Jesus, heal him. Jesus, help him. As soon as they encounter this man, they think, oh, this is a learnable or teachable moment for us. Let's use him as an object lesson. Jesus, what do you think about? And Jesus just dismisses the question and heals the man in rather dramatic form. Can you see, even the disciples are used to treating people as objects. And after the man has been healed, the Pharisees are at it again. They put him and his family through this horrible experience, like a religious tribunal, where they're all humiliated because they they aren't able to explain where Jesus' power came from, or they're not willing to uh, buckle under their pressure to say that that power came from Satan. This is treating people like objects, like things, like tools for our use or rejecting people for whom we have no use. But watch what Jesus does. You'll see it again and again and again. He doesn't objectify. He identifies the inherent worth and value and beauty in all people. You will see it over and over, the way in which Jesus treats people who have no use to him. The way he treats people who are often objectified or considered outsiders. Have a look at uh, the way he treats um, a Samaritan leper who after he heals a bunch of lepers, this one Samaritan comes back to praise God. Look at the way Jesus commends this man's faith. Looks not at him as a leper, as unclean, not as a Samaritan, as theologically wrong. He sees him inherently, beautifully, as a person who's expressing gratitude for the great blessing of God. Have a look at the way he treats a Roman centurion who comes to Jesus and says, you don't need to come to my home to heal my, uh, my, my, my servant. Just say the word. I know how it works. You say the word and I'm sure he would be healed. And Jesus looks at him and says, now this is to a Roman, he says, never have I seen such faith in all of Israel. The commending of inherent faith, even in a man who is not Jewish, this is completely different to objectifying people. What about the time when a woman reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment and is automatically healed from a bleeding disease? That's the most unclean disease you can have in the ancient world. The healing happens and she slinks away into the crowd, unseen, unknown, but watch what Jesus does. He calls her out of the darkness. He makes her stand before the assembly of men. And she says, he says to her, but really I think to everyone who's gathered, it was your faith that made you well. Go in peace. Women, the unclean, the Samaritans, Romans, children. You watch what he does again and again and again. The outsider, the ignored, the useless ones. He affirms and values inherently and beautifully. You can live in the world where you treat people as objects and you get treated as an object. 
That's one of the most, as I said, insidious expressions of human sin. That's the mountain of garbage I was talking about before. That's the muck and the mire and the brokenness. Jesus wades into that world. And in the midst of that world, he sees people. He honours people. He knows people. He loves people. And in this particular story we're looking at in John chapter 8, as they throw this woman like a tool, like an object, like a piece of meat at his feet and say, ha ha, we got you. Jesus responds, oh my gosh, in the cleverest way. You all know his answer. It's pretty well known. He says to them, hmm, okay. Guess that's what the law says, is it? Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we let he who is without sin cast the first stone? That's all he says. Now you watch what he's doing. By inviting them to rank themselves according to who has no sin and all the way down, presumably to the woman who is at the bottom, what he forces them with that one saying to do is to look within, to see themselves as sinner to compare themselves with each other, to try and figure out, am I more worthy or less than you or him or her? And also to look at the woman and to compare myself with her. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone is his way of saying, look at who you are and look at who he is and he is and he is and look and who she is. And having looked, you see, we are all part of a common humanity. They figure it out. His subversive question gets into their brains till in the end they realise, I'm not worthy to respond this way. And stone after stone after stone hits the ground. And then the story ends, as you know, as well as I do, that Jesus, the one who is without sin and who could cast the first stone, looks into this woman's face and says, has no one considered themselves worthy to condemn you? Oh, how did she get words out? No, she says, no, not one. And then Jesus looks at her and says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You can only say go and sin no more after you've said no, neither do I condemn you. The story of the woman caught in adultery actually shouldn't be called that. It should be the the, the story of the men caught in self-righteous, objectifying behaviour. That's the sin that is most obvious in this story. And Jesus shows them by his inherent stance of othering, of seeing, of loving, of being present to, that his way is inherently superior to any way that they may have chosen. My friends, this is at the very core of what it means for us to say to Jesus, just as the Father sent you, send me. Send me to do that. Send me to be like that, to wade into this world of objectifying, using behaviour. Send me to walk into that mountain of garbage of brokenness where people are just being used and using others. Send me into that world that I, like you, might see others, might honour others, might acknowledge others, might serve others, might humble myself before others and be an example of what it looks like to be you in this world. A few years ago, I was in... um, San Antonio, Texas, and uh, three big old Texan men came up to me, like older men, but big, tall, loud, confident Texan men. They told me that they were all retired, that they'd all done pretty well for themselves, and now they're wanting to really serve Jesus uh, in their retirement. They told me that they had heard me speak at a conference a few years earlier in Houston, Texas, and I talked to them about being sent once, about hearing Jesus say, just as the Father sent me, so I send you. And they decided rather than spending our retirement playing golf or, you know, working in our gardens, let's go do something. Let's be sent to someone. And the three of them had decided 
through whatever means that they should go and they should serve uh, with uh, the refugee community, Burmese refugee community in San Antonio. And so they told me how they, you know, they would turn up to their events and there was a community centre that they regularly engaged with and they'd done lots of work in helping uh, refugees get settled in housing and providing furniture and helping them with, with you know, uh, finding jobs and things like that. So they'd done really, really beautiful, beautiful work. But they said to me, we're not friends with Burmese refugees. I mean, they love what we do and they're grateful for it, but we kind of thought we would become like part of their community. It feels like there's just something missing. We just haven't been able to kind of really connect with them. Now, I'm not really good at giving kind of snap answers to people's questions like that. Actually, I'm usually pretty bad at it. But on this occasion, the Holy Spirit must have been at work because I just dropped this line. I said, well... Maybe that's because you have a kind of one-up, one-down relationship with them. Like you're the rich American retired white people and they're the poor refugees. Like they don't feel equal. You have you have better English than they have. You're, you're kind of wealthier. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why that would not feel like an equal relationship. But I said, what if you did something that made you humbled in their presence? And immediately one of them said, cooking. I said, what? He said, well, he said, I, I can't even really cook American food. He said, so definitely I wouldn't be able to cook Burmese food. And we often eat in their gatherings and we see them and they're just, um, they have this beautiful food and it's delicious. But, you know, I can't imagine I could ever cook something like that. I wonder if we could, we could ask them to show us how to cook. And I was like, that's just brilliant. I said, there's nothing like being taught by an expert to humble you when you don't know how to do what, what it is that you're learning. And I can just imagine these big old guys with their big, thick fingers, like trying to like create delicate Burmese food. I thought this would be perfect. I said, why don't you ask them to give you some cooking lessons? Well, I left San Antonio, but sometime later they sent me an email and they said, it was just the most incredible thing. They said, we went to them and we said, and our wives joined us and we said, we would love to learn how to cook traditional Burmese food, like properly, like really, like not just on the internet, but would you teach us? And they were saying, you know, we were, we were learning how to cook Burmese cuisine. They were getting it wrong all the time and the, all the Burmese were laughing at us and we were trying our hardest. And what that happened was this one up, one down relationship started to shift. And when we ate together, we ate together as brothers and sisters. Friends, it's one thing for the church to do acts of philanthropy, to give and to provide services. And, and that's good. Don't, don't get me wrong. But there's also a sense in which we need to wade into the mountain of garbage like Christ did. To be at one with. To be attendant to. Not to see someone as an object. Not to use them. Not to need them. Not to want them. But to say, as the Father sent me, I'm inviting you to experience the one who was sent by God, my King, my friend, my Saviour, Jesus. This is at the core of what it is to be missional, friends. It's not just about service provision, not that there's anything entirely wrong with that. And it's not just about the quality of our Sunday services or how good our sermons are or any of those sorts of things. What we will really be measured by when it comes to questions about how missional we are, is whether we as a church have been able to unleash scores or hundreds or thousands of people into our city to wade into the brokenness of this world, to see people, to acknowledge people, to honour people, to heal people, to serve people, just as Christ did. My friends, I know City Life has done a great deal of good and served a great many people over the years, and I pray you continue to do that. I pray also you continue to be inspired by the vision of Jesus, by the one who truly came, even to the most broken, even to the darkest places, to show love and compassion, to offer peace, justice, joy the experience of forgiveness and new life in Christ. Go in peace to your life and continue to do the great work of serving others in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, to Jesus' honour and glory.
Yeah. 